I would ask you to open up your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, as we continue our series through this book, through this precious epistle, this jewel. And as we contemplate specifically verses 10, 11, and 12 of this chapter, We've been going through a series on Trinitarian salvation as it is put forth here in chapter 1 of Ephesians in verses 3 through 14. So I'm going to read the last two words of verse 10 down through 11 and then finish out to the end of verse 12. Hear the word of the Lord, which has been inspired by the Spirit of God. Paul writes at the end of verse 10, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that as I endeavor to preach your word now, that you would give me great unction, that you would bring to my mind the scriptures which I have given myself to study this morning and this afternoon. Father, I pray that the hearers would be greatly affected by the truth of scripture, that their lives would be transformed, that their minds would be transformed, that those among your people who hear this, Father, would be conformed to the image of Christ and for the loss that they would be saved. That their their deadness to sin would be done away with as you raise them to spiritual life. I pray, Father, that you would grant them the gift of repentance, the gift of faith, faith in your promises regarding the finished work of your Son. And especially as we consider these truths concerning Christ, May they find themselves trusting in Him for their salvation by the end of this sermon. And Father, above all, we praise You and we glorify You for what You have done for us, for what You have procured for us, for what Christ our Lord has done by living and dying for us and on our behalf. Father, we pray You be glorified in us and in the preaching of the Word of God. Amen and amen. The Son's redemption, the redemption which Christ provides for us, is truly a glorious reality. That is why I've entitled this sermon, Trinitarian Salvation, the Son's Redemption, Part 3, because we are still contemplating the redemption of the Son of God, the redemption which Christ has brought about. For his people. It is truly glorious to consider the many truths that fit under that glorious umbrella. For the word redemption used here in chapter 1 of Ephesians carries with it many different senses. And with the concept of redemption, we find many other blessed realities that the child of God enjoys and that the child of God receives from God. In fact, we could say the study of redemption is truly a multifaceted and a multi-sub-subject issue to cover and to discuss and to study. In fact, I know that these couple of verses that I am going to preach from this afternoon will not even in my exegesis be fully exhausted for the truths that are put therein are so great, so grand, so mighty, taller than the tallest mountains, more vast than the greatest seas. These truths are indeed glorious. They are divine realities. And for the child of God, they bring great comfort. And even for the lost, it shows the beauty of salvation. See, friends, if any of you are unconverted today, I call you to come to Christ 
I call you to look at the truths that are preached to you in the next few moments. To seriously contemplate those realities. To seriously contemplate those truths. And to out of the beauty of salvation, out of the heavenliness of the doctrines, the doctrine of the gospel, may you find yourselves to be believers in it. And under this umbrella of redemption, there are multiple things that we are going to contemplate in this sermon, multiple truths. Firstly, our glorious inheritance, the weightiness of the fact that God has made us co-heirs with His Son, that God, brethren, has adopted us as His children, and just as any good father, He leaves an inheritance unto His children. And it is not an inheritance which will be squandered easily, but an eternal, infinite inheritance. And as we will see next time we consider this passage of Scripture, or maybe a few sermons later, the fact that the Spirit of God seals such an inheritance for us so that it might not ever be lost. Also, we consider the, the idea and the reality that our choosing, our being chosen by God the Father, is something which was done according to the will of God, to the philema of God, the hidden secret decretive will of the Father, and lastly, the fact that we in our salvation, Paul makes mention of in verse 12, are to give glory to God. For our salvation is again to the end that God himself might be glorified in us and in all that we do. In fact, this is a point that Paul himself is absolutely laboring with great fervor and zeal to, to put across to us to communicate to us. That is why in verse 6, he says concerning the Father's work that it is to the praise of the glory of His grace which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. And likewise here, he tacks on that phrase again in verse 12 at the end of the section where he discusses the work of the Son. And even in verse 14, he does the same thing using that phrase, to the praise of His glory when discussing the work of the Spirit. That is because the triune God has condescended and has decided to enact this blessed covenant of grace to save sinners from their sin. And this triune God has done it to manifest His glory and His manifold wisdom. And therefore, it is our great responsibility to give God the glory for the great things that He has done. And so let us consider these realities these truths that are put forth, and other truths as well, as we examine these verses that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. But, we must first consider the context, which is something that I have already briefly in part have done just a few moments ago in contemplating verse 6 and verse 14. But however, I want to get a greater full-orbed understanding of the context of this passage. Paul here, writing to the churches at Ephesus, begins his letter, this famed epistle, by discussing Trinitarian salvation. Specifically, he begins in verses 3 through 6 by explaining the Father's role in redemption, that being, of course, of election. And we have seen all of these passages thus brought forth. If you have been following along this series, then you know quite well and quite thoroughly what the Father has done for us in Christ. Chiefly, it is His elective purposes when we discuss His role in salvation. And then in verses 7 through 12, we see the work of the Son exposited and unpacked before our eyes. As Paul speaks of the, of the, the heaven, the, the, the glory of Christ... And then in verses 13 and 14, we find the work of the Spirit mentioned. And then at the second part of this chapter, in verses 15 through 23, we find Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, which we will soon contemplate as we draw near and nearer to that text. Now we have an understanding of where Paul the Apostle has come from 
and where he is going. Therefore, we can zoom in, knowing his argumentation quite well. We can zoom in on verses 10 through 12. And really, we're not considering all of verse 10, but simply two words that are put therein. It seems to be that the back in ages past, many, many years ago, when Bible translators put these verse indexes and the chapters in there, that in their translations, it seems to be that, or at least whatever translation they put those upon, that it attached those two words at the end of verse 10 to the preceding sentence. And verse 11 thus started a new sentence. However, my translation, the New American Standard, does not do that. It actually attaches those last two words of chapter of verse 10 to verse 11. Therefore, that is where we will begin as we consider these blessed truths of redemption. Firstly, I would like us to consider our glorious inheritance. Our glorious inheritance. Paul begins. He says in this new sentence, which opens at the end of verse 10, he simply says, <clears throat> In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Notice, brethren, with me for a moment, the first two words that are written there at the end of verse 10. In him. This is something which I do not have to labor over very much in this sermon. For many of you are quite acquainted with the biblical truth of the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. We know, of course, that salvation is only found in Christ, and there is no other way of salvation. But I do not preach concerning the saint, uh, for the sa sake of the saints in relation to these two words, but for you who are lost, for you unconverted souls, you pagans who are not in Christ, I exhort and plead with you by the mercies of God. I, I beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God through Him, to be found in Him, not having a righteousness of your own derived from the law, but righteousness that comes from Christ, from being found in Him. As Paul himself relates in Romans 8.1, he says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That verse there insinuates the reality that there once was condemnation for those who are outside of Christ, but who are now in Him. When they were outside of Him, they were under the wrath of the Father, as John 3.36 tells us. However, now that they have fled to Christ, as now that they have found refuge in the tower of salvation, they themselves can say that they will be freed, and they will be protected from the storm and the fury of the wrath of the Father. And so therefore, you who are lost and who are outside of Christ, the storm of God's wrath is on the horizon of your soul, soon to consume you. Therefore, you must flee. You must flee to the strong lighthouse of Christ, for those thick walls shall protect you on the day of wrath. It is said elsewhere in Romans by the Apostle Paul. In Romans 9.33, he quotes the Old Testament. He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. That is the promise of the gospel. You who are lost, that if you believe in Christ the Savior, you will not be disappointed. And brethren, even for you, this is an encouragement and an exhortation. Though very evangelistic, it is still for the saints of God. For we must keep believing in Christ, for He surely shall not fail to deliver on His promises. If we so easily believe the word of men when they promise to do something for us, or promise to give us something, how much more should we believe God who cannot lie? and who has clearly stated in his word these realities that Christ is a trustworthy Savior and that salvation is of him alone. In fact, just a few verses later in Romans 10, 11, he quotes again that, same very, that very same passage. 
under the inspiration and direction of the Spirit of God. He writes in verse 11, For the Scripture says, Whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. This is a point that the Apostle Paul wanted to get across in writing the book of Romans. That there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. But, quite interestingly enough, Paul was not the only New Testament writer to make mention of this Old Testament truth, this pearl. Peter, likewise, wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, he said, For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Notice the phrase there, in him, appears in the two passages in Romans that I read off to you and in that passage out of First Peter. Excuse me. The reality of salvation in Christ alone is something which all of the writers of Scripture unanimously together cry out in unison concerning. But going back to the passage at hand, in Ephesians 1.11, right after those two words in verse 10, which read, In Him, we find this written by the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 11, in, or excuse me, at the end of verse 10, I'll begin there. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance. We have an, obtained an inheritance. And brethren, this is the full thrust here of the first point that I would like to make. That we as children of God are co-heirs with Christ and we shall inherit the kingdom of God which has been prepared for us by the Father. We shall inherit that house in glory which Christ has begun construction on for us. Not a house that is physical or built with hands, but a, an eternal home with Him who ultimately is our rest, our Sabbath rest, Christ the Lord. We, brethren, have obtained it, firstly. Before I consider what exactly is this inheritance and what is the meaning of of that word. It is important to note and to consider the fact that the Apostle Paul is so confident of the believer's salvation, their eternal glorification, that he uses the term have obtained. These are not things which we are waiting for. These are not things that are that are contingent upon our wills or our strength. These are things which we have obtained. Not in the sense that they are a reality at this point, but in the sense that we have been given the promise of God concerning these things, and therefore they cannot fail. Jesus himself said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The word of Christ is settled in glory forever. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands and abides forever. As Isaiah the prophet wrote, Oh, brethren, this is of great, this is cause of great rejoicing for the believer, for the redeemed soul, because we have obtained an inheritance. It is certainly true that this is a future reality that is yet to be experienced by the children of God, but it is so sure and so set in stone by the will and the power of God that Paul writes in the past tense. He writes as though it is something we already have. And in fact, we have already tasted the first fruits of this glorious eternal redemption. Right now, we are possessed by the Spirit of God. He fills and abides within us, and He will never be taken away from us. He is the Spirit of Christ in us. We experience the, the blessed assurance that is given to us through the gospel. We experience joy and contentment and thankfulness in this life. Fruits which the Spirit of God brings forth in us 
These are some of the first fruits of this glorious inheritance. You could say that our inheritance is like a great chest filled with treasures, filled with golden coins and precious jewels, but it has yet to be opened. However, it is so packed and so crammed with glorious treasures and expensive diamonds that it is as if it is starting to bow and the top is starting to bend and warp and coins are spilling out and jewels are pouring forth into our poor beggar hands. Oh, brethren, we have glorious riches that are laid up for us in glory. Glorious riches in Christ, and we have already begun, begun to experience those precious realities even now. Oh, brethren, you who are poor as I, monetarily speaking, of course, take heart, for we have spiritual riches in Christ, and you, brethren, who are rich, do not consider your wealth in this life of any value or worth eternally. Do not have joy in that, no, but have joy in knowing that you have eternal riches in Christ. And you sinners, you poor lost souls, you may not know this, but you are poor. You are poor and miserable and wretched. And on the day of judgment when the Father, when you stand before Him, and his, burging, uh, his, his burning wrath is against you. And the debt of your sin is so great, you will not be able to pay up. You must have the, the work of Christ applied to you by the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you will be lost eternally. You must be rich in Christ. Or be eternally poor. So he says, we have obtained, and then he says, an inheritance. In Paul's day, in Greek and Roman culture as well, if a man owned great property or wealth when he was deceased, that property or wealth was dispersed equally among his sons. And is it no wonder, brethren, why Scripture says that we are the children of God, that we have been adopted? That the Father has chosen us to be His children? And is that not what chap uh, verse 5 of this very chapter reads? He predestined us to adoption as sons? Indeed. These truths in Scripture were not put there randomly or arbitrarily. These truths put forth in Scripture are there for a reason. To show us that we truly are heirs co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ who is our elder brother. Though Christ is the only begotten Son of God, we are the adopted sons and daughters. Let us not forget our female sisters, our female siblings in Christ. We are also are likewise sons of God. Not in the sense that we are begotten, but we have been adopted. But nonetheless, that still does not negate the reality and our right, our right to this inheritance. What does the book of John, the gospel of John, have to say concerning this? Listen to what it says. Listen to the authority of Scripture, verse 12. It says, But as many as received Him, that being Christ, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. Oh, friends, those who receive Christ, Christ gives them the right to become children of God. And thereby, being children of God, we have a right to this glorious inheritance that is freely ours by the grace of God. It is concerning this inheritance that Paul writes elsewhere in Galatians 3.18. He says, For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And we likewise, of course, as we know, Paul writes in that same chapter, are the sons and daughters of Abraham, for we follow in, the same, uh, follow in his footsteps of faith. 
Paul, Paul also wrote in Colossians 1.12, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Oh, my dear fellow saints, this inheritance is called by that very passage the inheritance of the saints. It is for us. It is not a nameless inheritance. It is not an inheritance that stands in an empty field as a, as a tall cylinder with no marking on it, with no one's name on it. No, brethren, but it bears our inscription. It bears our very names upon it, and it is ours to grab hold of because it has been purchased by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, as we considered earlier, Peter's testimony concerning this inheritance, I would like to consider what he had to say about this. Just give me one moment here as I turn. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What is so glorious about that, that text there are many things, but one of them I want to point out to you is the fact that, that Peter there writes that our salvation is one which will be revealed at the last time. As I said a moment ago, our salvation has already been accomplished. Yet there is a future aspect to this. That is why the New Testament records us as having been saved, being saved, and having our will that we will be saved. It is three tenses. The three tenses of salvation. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Firstly, justification. That would be the act of God whereby He pardons the sinner for Jesus' sake. This is something which, those, for those of you who are in Christ, has already happened for you. It is done, and nothing can reverse such a glorious, gracious act by God. Secondly, there is sanctification, which if you are in Christ, you are at present in. Even I myself am still, of course, in this. In fact, every believer who is alive on earth is in this stage of salvation, in this process, this middle point where we are growing in conformity and closer and closer conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, our elder brother, our co-heir to the throne and to the kingdom of God. And then lastly, there is the future aspect of salvation and that being glorification that we are awaiting still. And that happens, of course, when the believer breathes his last breath and stands before the Father and is received into celestial glory. That is the final aspect of salvation. And at that point there, it is done. And the Father has brought that precious saint into eternity future. Salvation is that which spans from eternity past to eternity future. It is truly a glorious reality. Also, glorification will take place when the Lord Jesus returns. For the saints who are alive when He returns will never taste death, but they will meet Him with all the saints who have been raised at His, res at his coming. 
They will meet them in the, in the clouds and then be glorified. But going back to the text of Scripture there, it says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Glory to God for this glorious inheritance. But we ask, how as the Father, and according to what, has he chosen us to this? How as the Father in eternity past set us apart to receive this? And that is the second truth I would like to contemplate. That we are chosen according to the will of God. Consider with me the second part of verse 11. Where Paul again writes, Having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Firstly, he writes there, Having been predestined. This likewise is a truth which we have already thoroughly considered here in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, especially in relation to the work of the Father. For here in Ephesians 1, that is mainly Paul's, uh, Paul's detailing and attention of the Father's work in salvation. It is election. It is predest predestination. In fact, in verses 3 through 6, Paul keeps it very constrained and very concise yet very meaty, very weighty, but still to the point. And simply put, I could, cons I could consolidate verses 3 through 6 by saying that the Father has chosen us from the foundation of the world or predestined us in Christ for glory. And this we know, for as I said, we have already looked at those ideas and those truths put forward very, very thoroughly. And therefore, we will not spend all too much time considering that, considering this reality of predestination, this truth, although how great comfort, uh, what great of a comfort it does bring to the heart of the, of the child of God. But specifically, what I want to contemplate is the second part of this phrase, where Paul writes, we have been uh, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. See, brethren, there is not a maverick molecule in the universe. There is not one bird whose wings fla um, flap up and down apart from the decree and the sovereign hand of God at work in those things. God is providentially working all things to his glory. And specifically when we contemplate salvation, as Paul so brilliantly does in Romans 9, we must realize that God is the sovereign free agent in the salvation of souls. He chooses ultimately whether one goes to heaven or chooses to pass them over and allow them to continue in their sin which they so love and ultimately be lost in hell forever. That is the divine prerogative of God. He is the potter and we are the clay in His hands. He is sovereign and in His sovereignty He is working all things after the counsel of His will. And therefore, in relation to our predestination, it was according to the will of the, of the Father. It was not something which He did out of obligation, or something which He did because He was so moved by our good performance which He saw in forbearance. Absolutely not, for there was nothing good in us, as we know, but did it out of His good pleasure. I want to consider this reality of God's sovereignty by contemplating what Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah 46. He writes in verse 1, Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. And the things that you, that you carry are burdensome. 
a load of, of the weary beasts. They stooped over. They have bowed down together. They could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old, old age I will be the same, and even to your graying years I will bear you. I have done it, and, you, and I will carry you. I will bear you, and I will deliver you. To whom would you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me? And we would be alike. Those who, who lavish gold from the purse, and weigh silver on the scale, hire a goldsmith, and he makes it into a god. They bow down, indeed, they worship it. They lift it up upon the shoulder and carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may carry it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none, no, no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. That portion of scripture from Isaiah is greatly telling of the character and the sovereignty of God over His creation. Truly, there is no one who can stay His hand or resist the sovereign working of God over creation. There is no one amongst the lump of clay that we all are who can say unto the potter, What have you done? Or why are you doing this? For He has the divine prerogative to do as He pleases. He is the King and we are his subjects, and therefore we must bow in reverence to him and not question his rule and his reign over every last one of us, brethren. And even you unconverted people, you unbelievers, I exhort you, do not blaspheme God. Do not blaspheme the king who rules over you and who in righteousness and justice wages war against his enemies and who will Surely punish those under his rule and reign who will not submit. And ultimately, they even they will submit. Even the most reluctant, the most vile wretches will find themselves on the day, on the day of judgment, as Philippians 2 tells us, even they, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Going back to Ephesians 1.11, it's important also to note in the second part of verse 11 when Paul says that we have been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will, that God's will is a twofold will. It is a twofold will. What do I mean by that? Well, we see put forth in Scripture, we see commands given to us. You shall not lie, you shall not steal. God wills that every man every, everywhere should repent. Such commands as these are called prescriptive commands by God, or as sometimes called the prescriptive will of God. That would be the, the, the aspect of God's will where He says He wants men to do this or that. And we all are very familiar with those commands put forth in Scripture that convey to us the reality of God's prescriptive will. And then there is a second aspect to the will of the Father. There is a second aspect to the will of God, and that is the secret or the decretive will of God. And that would be that which plays out on the earth daily. For we see in Scripture that it is the will of God that men repent and live in holiness. However, we do not see that necessarily play out for us. We do not see that reality necessarily in our own lives even at times. 
But that is nonetheless the will of God. That is still the will of the Father playing out. To you this may seem as a contradiction that in the character of God, God could be like this. But this is no contradiction. This issue is not an unresolved issue in the mind of God. But this is an easily settled issue. And how it can be that the will of God is such that it is twofold, I do not know. But this is left up to the wisdom and the infinite knowledge of God. In fact, as we consider the truths of salvation, we need to recall that Paul himself in Romans, one of the greatest theologians who has ever walked the face of the earth, who himself was visited personally by Christ when discussing the reality of God and salvation and His sovereign working among the children of men, he finally finds himself at the end of uh, Romans 11, saying simply in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became His counselor? So, brethren, therefore, let us not be hard-hearted and unbelieving, but let us, even when we cannot comprehend, believe. For we must believe to understand and not first understand to believe. It is also important to note the word here when it says, who works all things after the counsel of his will. That word works there. The Greek that is underlying there, the word energeo, is actually where we de- the word from which we derive the word energy or energize. It carries with it the idea of work and power and labor. In fact, it is derived from another Greek word, energes, which is derived from two Greek words put together. And those two Greek words, one of them means in and the other means labor or work. God is laboring and working energetically to bring about His decretive, sovereign will for His own glory. And it is important that we understand this. It truly is, for this is of great consolation for us. Great consolation for our hearts, brethren. Think about when we go through trials and hardship. We will not find ourselves being embittered, for we know, we know that God is sovereign and that all things are working according to His sovereign will. And therefore, who are we? Who are we to question the sovereignty of God in our own lives? When we understand that we are but pot, um, we are but clay in the hands of the potter. Truly, then, can we be satisfied in His sovereignty? So we have been chosen according to the will of God. But, however, we ask, what is the end, ultimately? What is the end to this? And you probably already know the answer if you simply look over into verse 12, and if you simply recall what I said at the outset of this sermon. And that is the third point that I would like us to consider this afternoon. And that is that we are saved to the glory of God. Look with me at verse 12. Paul writes to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Very quickly, beginning at verse 12, he says to the end, this is the chief end of salvation. And we know this not only from other passages of scripture, but even from this very chapter, for we saw in verse 6 that God the Father has predestined us to the praise of His glory. And in verse 14, the Spirit of God seals us for our salvation 
for the praise and to the praise of the glory of God. And therefore, likewise, with the work of Christ, it is to the glory and praise and honor of God. Notice he says here also, we who were the first to hope in Christ. Who is he referencing there? Who is he speaking of? Well, that would be the Jewish people. The first converts to Christianity. The first fruits into the church of God. He, there, he hereby saying this puts the Gentile and the Jew alike together. And he really is anticipating what he later will write in Ephesians concerning the fact that both Jew and Gentile alike are one in Christ. He says in two, verse 219, So then you are no, long, no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom we have in whom the whole building having excuse me being filled together is growing into a holy temple of the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit as we know from the records of church history and specifically of course the inspired record the book of acts that one of the great controversies that choked the church for so long was the acceptance of the Gentile believer amongst the Jewish believers. But as we know from the record of Holy Scripture, that God in His sovereignty brought about those events in His timing and in His way. And we know that since Jew and Gentile believers have lived in great harmony with one another. And here Paul reaffirms that blessed reality that took place just a few years prior to the writing of this book of Ephesians. That reality that both Jew and Gentile, that such de designations do not mean anything in Christ. Even the designations of male or female, slave or free, mean nothing, for we are all one in Christ, all equal, all co heirs with Christ, co heirs of that glorious inheritance. Also, he notes simply by using the phrase hope in Christ, what one of the aspects of salvation is. It is finding hope. Oh, brethren, look around you. Look in this world that we live in. We live in a world of hopelessness. We see our pagan society, our post-Christian society, this, the lost souls that are found therein, those who are entertaining themselves with the cares of this life, are slaves to sin and slaves to hopelessness. They try and fill up their minds and their time with the activities of this world. But they never can find anything that satisfies. They must go every weekend and get hammered. They must take that next shot of meth. They must have that next sexual act performed upon them in some way trying to find hope, trying to find satisfaction. But sin does not satisfy. Sin does not deliver on that which it promises. And we ourselves know even from experience that reality. That even as believers, when we've been tempted to sin and we have followed sin and followed it as a deceiver, we thought that what it promised, it would have given us. But we know instead that we were left empty, poor, miserable, and wretched, and broken inwardly knowing that we have defended our Father and we have brought great grief upon him. But therefore we ask ourselves, what is salvation in light of this hopeless world? Well, it is hope in Christ. Brethren, there is something that I cannot explain to you, and especially you unconverted souls, something which I cannot bring to you fully and put it into words that quite do it justice. And that is the joy in the bosom of the genuine believer who comprehends 
eternal salvation? Who comprehends the fact that their eternity is sealed and when they die they will pass on from this life into glory and they will forever be with Christ their Lord? This is truly glorious and brings great hope to the child of God. Verse 12, lastly, he closes this section by saying, Would be to the praise of his glory. In other words, to the glory of God, this salvation has been so ordered. To the glory of God, this salvation has so been brought about. But I want us to consider, brethren, one, uh, two things very briefly in closing concerning the glory of God. We obviously know that is the chief end to which God is working all things. However, brethren, under that great point is a sub-point in the workings of God. And that is that the Father is not only working all things for His glory, but also for our good. And ultimately, in the accomplishment of our good, He is bringing about the glorification of His name. As Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 28, he says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. He uses very similar language to that which he employs here in Ephesians 1. And that is precisely because that is what the Father is doing. He is working all things for both, both for our good and for his glory. He caused Isaiah the prophet to write in Isaiah 48. He said, I will not give my glory to another. And he even promised to act and to work among the Israelites for his namesake, for his glory. Oh, brethren, there is a great mystery found here. That as the Father brings about our good and our eternal salvation, in that he is bringing glory and honor and praise to his holy name. And that ought to bring great comfort to our hearts. That ought to bring great comfort to our souls to know that God is working all those things for His glory. And so to Him be glory indeed. I love what the writer of the epistle of Jude, what Jude wrote. In Jude one twenty four. he says, Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Fellow Christians, I encourage you to be encouraged by these truths and to be ever so diligent by the power which the Spirit of God supplies to apply these to your own lives and to go home and search out the scriptures which I have mentioned in this sermon to go home and study diligently the truths that I have conveyed here today and to do it for the glory of God. And briefly, you who say you're Christians but are not, you who say you know Christ but do not live for Christ, I try and address such as you every time I preach because there are so many of you around us. I encourage you, if you claim to, to be a believer in Christ, to examine yourself today and to see whether you're in the faith. And if you are outside of Christ, I implore and I exhort you to flee to Him truly. And for you who are outside of Him and know you are outside of Him, as I have cried out to you various times throughout this sermon, I plead with you at the end of it to flee. Flee your sin and flee to the Savior for the glory of God the Father. So we have seen in these few verses here in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 10, 11, and 12 that we as believers have received a glorious inheritance. Two, that we have been chosen according to the will of God. And three, we have been saved to the glory of God. Indeed, these are blessed and glorious realities. And this God who is working all things to the end that He Himself might be glorified is the holy God of Scripture, the righteous, just judge of the universe, and He has given His law to, for us to obey. His commands, His holy commands, you shall not lie or steal or blaspheme, commands which reflect His perfect character, but show us our broken character and our filth. For we see the law of God and we see that we have trampled it underfoot and we deserve hell for our sins, brethren. 
And we know this. And you unconverted souls must grasp this before you can grasp the grace of Christ. You must understand this, that you have sinned and offended God, that you have broken His law. His law is a mirror which shows us how filthy we are and shows us that we desperately need cleansing by the precious blood of Christ. So you who are lost, flee! Flee to the Savior from your sin. Flee to Christ. Or else be lost. But in this state of helplessness, condemned to hell, we are not only helpless, but hopeless. However, God in His love sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law and then died upon the cross of Calvary as a sacrifice for sin. He satisfied the wrath of the Father against us in our sin. That shows us the holiness and the grace of the Father. After three days, He was raised to spiritual life, raised to physical life. He was raised as the public display that the Father had received His sacrifice as a sufficient payment for our sins. And excuse me, it was not that Christ was raised to spiritual life, physical life. He was raised to life. He was raised again on the third day. Excuse my improper language there. But He was raised to life on the third day. After 40 days of further ministry, He was exalted into glory. He was received into heaven and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He has completed the work of eternal salvation once for all the saints. And therefore, the call of the gospel is that the sinner must repent. They must turn from their sin. They must change their mind and believe. They must believe the promises of God as they're put forth in Scripture. Believe that Jesus is a Savior, the sufficient Savior. And they themselves will have complete forgiveness of all their sins, past, present, and future, because of Christ's work at the cross. And they will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, which He fulfilled in His perfect life. Christ takes our sin and we get His righteousness as a gift of grace. This is the gospel of grace. This is the gospel of the glory of God. And those who are truly saved by the grace of God will be changed forevermore. Their thoughts, their words, their actions, their deeds, everything about them will be changed by the grace of God and for the glory of God. And that's why I challenge you who are lost or you who say you're religious to examine yourselves because if you have, do not bear fruit, it is because the tree was never planted. So turn. Turn to Christ truly that you might bear fruit for the glory of God. And this gospel is not only for the lost or for the unconverted, but even for the saint, for the child of God to feed upon as our daily bread. Oh, brethren, I encourage you to rest once more in the gospel truths. It's all by grace. All by grace. And all for the glory of God. All to the glory of the triune God and the Father in His election, the Son in His redemption, and the Spirit in His sealing. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I pray that you would bless your word as it has gone forth. Pray that you would bless me and all your people who have heard it, that we would grow in grace. And Father, I pray for unconverted souls who heard the preaching of the gospel, for them to be saved. Father, we praise you. We glorify you for what you have done in Jesus Christ, that you sent him into the world to save sinners. Save sinners through his death and burial and resurrection. We thank you for these things. We pray you be glorified in us and in all things. Amen and amen.